Yes. Welcome back to another episode of Teaching with the Body and Mind. I'm Mike. Wait, and wait, I'm... wait, wait. What? No. Uh oh. That early childhood nerd. Welcome to that early childhood nerd, everybody. I no, I think you're a guest on our episode. No, uh, that our... can't be right. That can't be okay. right. What's All happening? Right. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> we are so talented. That was <laughs> that was yeah, that was acting. That, that was, was whose line level <laughs> improv. Yeah. So yeah, obviously we are doing a crossover episode. We should have of... had our cameras off until now. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we fucked it up. Yeah, Sorry. for YouTube, this is not what a... your explicit warning is on your okay. an E, it's okay. All right. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. So we're doing a crossover episode of Teaching with the Body and Mind and that early childhood nerd. Um yep. and so we were realizing that our formats are slightly different. So um if you're listening to this on Teaching with the Body and Mind, um I'm imagining we'll be doing three episodes. So you'll <laughs> You'll hear it fade out at some point and Joey telling you, hey, we'll have that more next week. Yeah. Um, and Heather, you're probably going to just one big do your chunk. one big chunk. Mm -hmm. um, right. Maybe some polka music at the beginning. Absolutely. Mm. All right. Listen, um, the polka music is very important. I know it's a joke, but I'm here because of my Polish grandma and I was raised on that Polish med medicine <laughs> music. I mean, so, medicine is music, so I think that that's is... right. That Polish polka medicine. Um, that's why it's polka. All right. But we actually are going to, um, we had already agreed to follow in your, more of your format of starting with a quote. So yeah. I am actually going to let you take yeah. it over. Did you share the quote with anybody else? Yeah, everyone oh, okay. read it. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourself first. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, so that um, just kind of who you are and um, you are the hosts of my um, my favorite early childhood podcast because I don't listen to my own um, teaching with the body and mind. So um, Mike, would you start and we'll just. We'll just yeah. Yeah. So I'm Mike Huber and um, I'm the director of curriculum at Rise Early Learning in St. Louis Park, Minnesota and author of Embracing Rough and Tumble Play, Inclusion Includes Us, and soon, The Power and Pretend. And um, yeah, I do a podcast, which <laughs> I guess people know. So yeah. Thanks. Let's say Tom's next. Well, I'm Tom, Tom Bedard. Um, I, I'm the old man of the group. Uh, I have, I, I retired about eight years ago. But I'm still active, you know, um, with this with the podcast, teaching with the body and mind, and I'm doing more reading than I've ever done in the field. I wish I'd been reading all along, but it gives me a time, a chance to reflect on my practice. So mm -hmm. um, I I feel like I've uh, well, I say I've been part of the early childhood community for over forty years. So it's getting close to fifty years. Yeah, getting close to fifty. And one of the things I do, I do have a, I do have a blog, and that blog talks about sensory motor play around the sensory table, um, and it's it's been a platform for people from all all walks of life to reflect on the the play and exploration of kids around the sensory table. Thanks, yay, Tom. Hi, <laughs> Joey. Hi. Uh... I'm Joey Schoen, and I am the assistant director and also a teacher at Dodge Nature Preschool in West St. Paul, Minnesota, which is a nature-based um, program, which means we get to get outside every day and have access to um, a lot of land, about 110 acres of, of non-licensed space that we get to explore with the kids. Um, and I've uh, been in the game for not as long as Tom and Mike, but um, <laughs> long enough to call myself the old lady of the group, I guess. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I can have the title no matter what. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm about thirty. I don't know what's what's about thirty five, maybe thirty five years in the field. So you look about thirty five. No, <laughs> I'm going to be fifty four next weekend, folks. Happy birthday to me! Um, thank you, Joey. Okay, Ross. Uh, yeah, I'm Ross Thompson. I'm currently a uh, classroom teacher uh, at the Grace Neighborhood Nursery School. 
uh, which is located in uptown, kind of South Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I guess I'm classroom teacher. I'm a school bus driver. I'm field trip coordinator. I'm afternoon kind of discovery class teacher, uh, fix it person. I, I uh, <laughs> often refer to myself as the uh, the man from the caps for sale uh, uh, yes. book who uh, just keeps piling more and more caps on. Uh, I think there have not been any monkeys to come and uh, steal them away from me. So I wouldn't mind a little reprieve from time to time, but no. uh, That's why we've asked you here today. (laughs) And Heather, before you do the quote, um, you should also tell us who you are. Oh, I'm Heather Burnt Santee and I'm in Lafayette, Indiana. Um, I, my, my paying gig is that I'm the early childhood program chair and only faculty of a department at a community college here. And, um, I host a podcast called That Early Childhood Nerd. Um, and I, like I said, I've been doing this about 35 years. I started when I was 19 in a child care center, um, like we, so many of us do. I just liked being with kids and was good with kids and didn't know it was a thing you could learn about um, until a few years later when I accidentally found a book. So, um, and now I'm here with you all and it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> So fun. Yeah. Um, Okay. So the book is coming or the book is coming. The quote is coming from this book, Child Honoring, How to Turn This World Around, um, which is a collection of of essays um, put together by Rafi. So this quote comes from the the introduction, which Rafi wrote. Um, And he said, what does it mean to honor children? It means seeing them for the creatively intelligent people they are, respecting their personhood as their own, recognize them as essential members of the community and providing the fundamental nurturance they need in order to flourish. And I picked this one, um, one, because it's sufficiently vague for us to go wherever we want with it. But one of the things that I am so grateful to you all for is the way that I'm learning and others are learning about um, movement beyond just like planning movement songs and having actions that go with our circle time and those kinds of things and and really honoring the child's need and right to move their body in the ways that they need to move their body um and so I thought I could make that that quote fit what I what I love hearing you all talk about and now it'll be dead air for two minutes <laughs> yeah. while we wait somebody waits to jump in yeah. no I, think- I was actually going to just pull it up on my phone because I yeah, we're, we're not as... pretending to listen, but not actually listening. <laughs> so yeah, I guess you know. I know there. you all are very um, polite and and wait and take turns on your show, and it's <laughs> mine. Weird. It's Have just you, sort you of you haven't actually show, listened. So. So. <laughs> Jump, jumping all on top of each other. Yeah, uh, I said that's what time of day we record. That's, yeah, yeah. Also very true. Yeah, right, I think it's great. It. I think like just uh, what does it mean to earn, to honor children? And I feel like as you're just kind of. Uh, saying or speaking to Heather's that I think that's we um just had our 300th episode and we kind of did an ask me anything reflection piece and that was one thing that came up in one of the questions for me was it feels like what we've done with our discussions is a is another way to honor children and honor childhood to really recognize what it means to be a child versus what it is that we when you become an adult what you think childhood should be you know, trying to for we we forget about all the movement that's needed, all the fidgeting, all the 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 hugs, the tackling, the the movement, and how that's a part of it. But also that we can embrace it and see that as these are teachable moments, these are learning opportunities. And I feel like that's in a way that one of the ways that we've done our part to kind of honor children, honor childhood, is to help others kind of revisit, reflect, or kind of even think back to their own childhood themselves. Oh, wait, I'm asking children to sit all the time, but I didn't really like to sit all the time. So why am I doing that? Right. Cause I think what you said, you know, that it's teaching moments. And I think sometimes adults take that to mean helping them learn to be adults. Oh yeah. Adults don't sit on each other. Right. And instead it's like, no, you can teach them to be part of a community. And that's what it, one of the things I like about Rafi's quote is honoring them is helping them be part of the community. So sitting on your, you know, somebody else who is cracking up because you're sitting on them (laughs) is great. And that's not the teaching moment. The teaching moment is if you also, your feet end up kicking the other kid. That's the teaching moment of how can you be part of this community and and that child who wasn't 
interested in having you sit on them is also honored and not just you, right? And so um, helping facilitate that, that's what, you know, so part of honoring childhood maybe is us learning, like every day I'd say we, we, we've been talking now for, I don't know how many years as a group, even before the podcast, that we always have something to talk about because it's always like, oh, I don't understand <laughs> what it means to be this child. You know, I, right. I thought I understood, I understood these kids. And there's always been a few puzzling moments, but. Um, so I want to yeah. go, I want to go back in time a little bit to talk about how we actually came to be. So it, it started at the national conference. Uh, I met Mike and we started to talk and we said, well, let's do a proposal about um, children's rough and tumble play. And uh, we, we, we did the proposal. It was not accepted. Um, we were, we were a little surprised, but anyway, uh, we thought we had such a good topic. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our discussions about when we were writing the proposal were so fruitful that I said, let's, 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 do, let's keep this going. And then we started to invite other people. And we ended up with this core group, uh, Ross and Joey and Mike and myself. And uh, we, we, we just kept talking. And then these young people said, well, let's do a podcast. And so uh, I said, well, well, I'll go along with it. And, it. and the reason was nobody was talking about how important it was for children to move to learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were, they're always physical. They're always moving. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Right. And, you know, with it, I, at one, at some point in time, I said, this is a thinking group and we will come together and talk about something that we want to process. Uh, so something that happened in our classroom, we want to process it. And it was, it, it ended up to be, or it still is, um, very, for us, entertaining, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but also very fruitful. Yeah. And well, I want to add, oh, can I just add, yeah. like, I think, um, the way Tom, you said, like, it's not only, it's not a good thing, a bad thing. I think it's, I think as we've discussed and really kind of focused on, it's like, it's an inherent thing that movement is necessary for learning, even, you know, whether, no matter what your ability level and, you know, your ableness kind of is that we're inherently built to move. And that's how our brains process and start to put information together. So it's not even just, I think we've tried to really push that note of like, you can see it as good, bad, challenging, you know, rewarding, but also we want to recognize that this is inside all of us in order to be, you know, the body is that main vein, that kind of tool for thinking and learning. That's what I was going to say is sort of like, you can't, you can't honor childhood without honoring movement. Um, because the way our species develops is you move a whole lot when you're mm -hmm. little. I mean, like it's natural to get more sedentary as you age. Obviously we could argue maybe we've gone too far with being sedentary mm -hmm. in our culture, but like also just, you know, younger, younger children are always going to move more. And so you can't honor childhood without accepting it, understanding it, valuing it and seeing it as a necessary part of, of learning, which I think is what everybody's sort of mm -hmm. just, just said. I just was going to, yeah add that to it so it's like and I think we kind of always remind ourselves like part of our conversations of reminding ourselves that a maybe not everybody remembers that you know because you're in your own grown-up body and you're like oh that looks awful I do not <laughs> want to jump down that whatever hill you know and and so we think what's wrong with those kids rather yeah. than this is this looks yeah, kids are not defective adults and right, right. and that often is without people saying it, no one yeah. says that out loud, but we can treat kids that way. Yeah. We euphem euphemize it. Like we, we kind of say it out loud. It just requires a little yeah, yeah. Um So I just did a, I was just asked to do a, a workshop on teaching active children. And we had to sit down before I agreed and say, okay, do you, are you asking me to do something about movement and its importance and its contribution to learning? Or are you asking me how to make them stop being active so you can teach them? Um, mm -hmm. Because it surprised they were on the other, you know, they wanted tips for how to um, the ladder. stop make the movement. Less active. And yeah. yeah. And, and it just, it reminded me of one of my big pet peeves is when people say, and I've said this and, and it's a pet peeve now, partly because what I've learned from you, you all, um, 
uh, when people say something like, well, you know, we need to let them get the wiggles out as if that's the only reason we could conceive of to allow children to move in big, messy, weird, inconvenient ways. Well, I think um, that's the other, and I don't know if I have this, sorry, I'll have to work to tie this to your quote, but. No, forget <laughs> the quote. Like really we're far think. enough in. I know, we, but yeah. uh, I think that's the other thing that comes up in our conversation sometimes like, oh, wait, does this fit with our framework of teaching with the body and, you know, kind of trying not to wander too far from mm -hmm. our initial um uh th thing that we focus on but like the mind body split is is fake mm -hmm. you know it's like it's not a real you know obviously in our culture it's a strong strong component that of how we yeah. how we default to think about people mm -hmm. that oh they can think without feeling something or we have those kinds of things but just that like oh we'll get the wiggles out so we can get to their brain mm -hmm. like i what yes. i need to do is put abc right in that skull and shoot they keep rolling like they're and never it's true that that movement allows them to focus and, you know, sit in the, all those things that that eventually it, we have as goals for children. But why not just let them yeah. be well, human children? <laughs> earlier, <laughs> we were we had a long time to be able to talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Heather but, uh, to everybody. <laughs> but Tom was talking. So Tom lives across the street from the Minnesota State Fair. Ooh. Right. And um, has people park you know, in his yard and, you know, makes a little extra money that way. Mm -hmm. But he was talking about how he always tells people, okay, you're right near the water tower, you know, look there. So when you're in the gate, go to the gate by the water tower and then you're across the street, you know, but he physically points mm -hmm. as he's doing it. And there's plenty of evidence that even though the person is like hardly paying attention, they're just like, I just, it took me an hour to get here because of all the traffic. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go walk through this for five hours. I'm going to come out a zombie and I'm going to forget everything you just said. But what they do remember is the hand motions. And there's, oh. you know, research that shows this, that people will remember things and apply it if they watched you physically point or demonstrate directions. If you just tell them verbally, um, and if you've ever tried to just listen to Siri or whoever, you know, tell you which way to go, like, what you know like um i always glance at the map you know mm -hmm. on my screen like which way yeah. even though they just said right right yeah like wait what did she th i can't right, remember right. like two seconds later i can't remember yeah yeah how to pick and up. so yeah. there's that um that visual component even for adults moving your body or watching other people move their bodies is how we think mm -hmm. you know Heather, and did you do the training what did you I do did, the yes. training to oh, yes, teach I did. them how to get the wiggles out? No, I did not. I said I will do it if I can do it my way, and I did it my way. And, and what um, did the teachers how think? Is it, how was it received? <clears throat> the teachers loved it. The the um, administrator, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, I really like how, how you, how you uh, contrasted the two approaches to uh, movement, and it, it makes me think of we... We four did a, a, a NACI presentation um, and it actually went really well. Um, but one of the things that we emphasize is so often uh, teachers or administrators, they, they do that, that the thing about getting the wiggles out. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many different sessions that talk about how do I control the 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 busy child or the, the and <laughs> and I think we were one of the few groups that talked about well it's okay to move it's okay yeah. to do <clears throat> so I really like the way you the way you uh, <laughs> contrasted the two approaches yeah and and I think it's important I, because one of the things that I think the four of us did and I think it's mostly due to Tom because our discussions we Tom would come in and like watch this thirty second video of something from my classroom. And let's all talk about it. And that idea of really analyzing for an hour something that the kids did in 30 seconds. And it was like a kid on top of a a mat on a cube and there's another kid underneath and it's now getting squashed. And, you know, things like that. Just these like, huh, what is going on? Why? And they're all having fun. They all want to be, you know, like try this out. And But in our presentations, we would divide the audience into four groups. And one group watched it from the lens of the child watch this and what do you think the children are feeling one was the parents if you were the parent of this child what would you think one was the teachers and then one was admin administration 
And then we'd usually have people do at least one other group. So you, and you get to hear from each other. And that, I think that is the thing because administration, they want to walk down the hall, peek in the classroom. They see all the children are behaving or whatever. It's like, okay, that room is under control. They go yeah. into peek in another room and kids are all jumping around. It's like, oh, but what about the learning? And if they don't understand, no, no, which class yeah. do you think is more learning? If you th think of learning as taking information and experience, reflecting on it and applying it in other ways in the future, mm -hmm. which room is there more learning? Yeah, but, but I think that's another distinction that I have been making for myself is <clears throat> in the room where everything's controlled and quiet, that's really more teaching. And the room where everybody's moving is really more learning if we really broke it down. But every but we're all, you know, we all have one lens for what right. uh -huh. what learning children look like. And that's still they need they're still when they're learning. Yeah. Um, but if we really want to be specific, the teacher who's in control might feel like they're teaching. Um right. but and real I, learning, I don't know. I was gonna say like what I what I also really appreciate about that now, if like being able to look back at that specific training. We looked at those short videos and we said we took an hour or more to look at just a few of these things, but the amount of discussion time that was needed for those, for the adults in that room to go, to really start to shift their perspective and go, oh, wait a minute, this, this isn't just pure chaos, that there can be some things happening here. But as you, you know, if you've listened to us before, it's very likely you've heard us at one point say, you know, it's not just, you know, a free for all. Right. This doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want, whenever you want, that the movement can happen, whatever. So like, I think there's that, it's one, finding that balance, but also recognizing if we're going to have that teaching time where we're going to kind of sit together, you know, for us, it's, it's not crisscross applesauce mm -hmm. bubble in your mouth, you know, all right. eyes on me, blah, blah, blah. It's yeah. If you, here's a fidget basket. If you need to hold something, if you need to kind of lay on somebody next to you, as long as you're, if we can recognize the need for it, but then also can recognize is it is it disruptive? Is it keeping you from actually engaging, or is this helping you stay you, more focused? Right. Yeah. And for me, I think that this group helped me do that. Having those twenty minute, thirty minute, hour long discussions about something so small made it so that when I was in the classroom and a child was doing something unexpected, I could oh I don't know exactly what I think about this yet, but there seems to be a need. <laughs> And so I'd mostly look for, um, I think I got this from Francis Carlson of, are the children moving toward each other or away from each other? Uh, if they both like this, they're meeting a need in some way. And if I trust that, um, then, you know, that's like Elizabeth Jones, I, I guess, like, oh, I need to trust them. They are choosing something that they need right now, even though I don't understand it. And I know then I can go to this group, you know, later in the month yeah. and like, hey, this thing happened. What do you think? And then I like, oh, that was the moment. And so I, I do think that I, I, I appreciate that people listen to my, to our podcast, my, my yeah. podcast. Thank yeah, you all Mike. for being part of my yeah. world. Um, my liege. But yeah. But just that idea that find people to talk to about it, because I think that the more <clears> you <throat> take one moment and think, oh my gosh, there's all these things happening the more I think about it. You don't have to figure it out for every moment, but you can allow for it to happen and know, oh, this child knows something I don't. Mm -hmm. well, one thing about we picked what they apart recently was like, you know, what is it, what does it mean to sort of understand development? You know, like, where is it working for us? Where is it setting standards that aren't, you know, maybe reasonable? Like, anyway, maybe some <laughs> people heard that one. Um, but that's something I got from very much from this group, uh, you know, combination of things. And I'm thinking of Mike pointing out, like, you know, you go to... Um, you go to the beach with a kid and they don't go out and like swim laps, you know, like an adult would be like, now it is time to swim. I will swim for 30 <laughs> minutes and then I will be done with my swimming. You know, they run, they splash, they rest, they get up, they do it again, you know, or whatever the, the sequence of things might be that it's not this like juice box, juice box. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then I think of, um, and then I merge that with the, just thinking about the videos that we used to look at that are sort of notorious, whether people have seen them or not, the fight the ball video that Tom brought to us, which has these kids in this pretty intense um, physical game, kind of like preschool basketball for, for best shorthanding. And then he's got a follow-up video of a short period after they're sitting at a table and drawing. And so mm -hmm. it's like reminding ourselves that 
these active kids, you know, who need to be, you know, it's like, if you let it happen, it's going to, mm-hmm. it's going to be these waves and it's not going to be, you know, all day long because that's just not also how kids are, you know, but the, putting the lid on it all the time means it never actually, right. they never actually get to ride those waves. So anyway, this is a long way to say, I think you do have to understand development and what to right. expect. Otherwise you panic, you might panic and think, oh, this, they're going to do this all the time versus, you know, supporting it and letting these natural waves ride out. I think yeah. that's something that this group has touched on. Over so the Ma- years. Mike, Mike um, referenced the video where the, the kid is sinking into the cube and squishing another child. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember um, it, at, at the conference, I had the group of parents or they were taking the view of the parents and one of the parents said and I'll never forget it she said uh, I wish my child could be in that classroom because she had a boisterous child who was always being put down you know you gotta gotta be nice you gotta be quiet you gotta do this get your wiggles out <laughs> yes exactly yeah. and she was so you gotta earn those wiggles she was so impressed with that video and huh. the, what that meant for those children. Yeah. And I think I, that, go ahead, Heather. Well, I know just, that just reminds me of a story that I've probably told often, but we were, you, you all were talking about your group time or your story time. I think maybe Ross, it was you I, that you can sit in different ways. You mm-hmm. don't have to be. So the last time I was directly working with, with children a few years ago, um, Gus has become sort of famous on my show because he was um, he came from another childcare situation where at three three and a half four he'd already been kicked out a few times for for movement and it was all around circle time um, and he'd get sent to time out for not sitting still um, you're not sitting still here go sit still over there I didn't quite get understand the logic but exactly. it makes perfect sense I don't understand yeah. what's the problem and then he oh, got in trouble for going to time out instead of coming to circle time first because he knew that's where he was going to end up um oh, gosh but oh. I know but so when we when we were doing our story time he was just like walking the room but he was still an active participant in the group mm-hmm. Um, because he would he would just call out his answers from wherever he uh-huh. was in the room like it was helping him focus to do that so if, exactly if my reading goal is so important that I'm gonna um, you know ostracize a child for not um, paying attention quote unquote why why wouldn't I welcome this other way that he's showing me right. that he and is it's honoring attention. the humanity right because yeah. like people are probably not listening to this podcast all sitting down crisscross applesauce or the grown-up version sitting with their, you know, in the chair, facing forward. Yeah. Maybe that taking notes. Chair. Yeah. You know, it's so like they're probably doing to... the dishes, driving, <laughs> uh, whatever. Yeah. You know, hopefully, and if they're watching the YouTube version, hopefully yeah. not That's driving. That's the part of honoring the child when you're making room right. for yeah. the boisterous child or the child who doesn't doesn't act quite like everybody else, mm-hmm. but still can find a place in the group. Mm-hmm. That's really well, honoring the child. That's, I mean, that's part of the quote that we have is like recognizing them as essential members of the community. Right. You're only essential if you fit this mold. Right. <clears throat> so you better, and and you're, at, especially at three, you're doing just what feels natural inside of you. This is actually what I need to do to process this information. I mean, I'll watch the YouTube video after when this gets posted. I'm going to be like, God, I cannot like... Everyone else is pretty stoic, and I'm just like b- pinballing around my screen. <laughs> well, I'm and sitting in a chair this time. Last yeah. time I recorded with Heather, I was standing, and she was like, "Are you on a ball or something?" Because he, he was like, "I'm still probably this. moving a bit." But. <laughs> but, it, but you know, it's like I I was a child who did have to move, and I and I eventually learned how to like do the movements through fidgets or through mm-hmm. like doodling and things like that. But it's it's exactly what you said, Heather. It's like. I know they're still participating because they're giving the answers. And you know what? In this case, they're the only one who actually gave an answer (laughs) that was relevant to what we're talking about. They're not talking about their dog's wet nose or how they went to, you know, you know, uh, the restaurant last night. Like, oh, we're talking, you're, you're giving the answer about the conversation Mm -hmm. we're having. So again, it's like, if we're going to truly show you as a, as a representative of this community, that you're essential to it, you and who you are and what you bring is essential. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, I want to give Gus some of those skills for later on. Like, you know, if you do feel wiggly, here's, here's something you can hold, or maybe here's that bumpy seat that you can sit on that might help you. But also 
as you said, what's the what's the the main learning objective? Is it that we all sit and we can sit for 30 minutes without interrupting the teacher? <laughs> or is it that because because there's another couple adult scenarios where you have to sit for long periods of time and not be told until you know spoken to, otherwise you get in big trouble. Uh, you know, that maybe aren't as fun places to be when you're a grown up. <laughs> I'm talking about incarceration, but um you, oh, know, they, like, <laughs> you know, the so at, we 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 say we want to individualize lesson lessons yeah. and learning and things, but I'm only gonna do it to the to the level that I can handle. Mm -hmm. And I want to acknowledge that that's also a, a real place to be for the adult, for the teacher. But if you're always having that fight with with Gus, step back and like, well, what am I, what, what is it a me problem? Mm -hmm. Or is this truly something that he's, when he get up, he's knocking markers over, right. there's cups mm -hmm. going, oh, oh, okay, that's different. But if it's, he just needs to move. Well, and it can be I... baby steps. You know, that's yeah. the other part that I think, um, I don't know, I feel like Joey, you always remind us of, right? That like, people can't just jump from one thing to the other. I remember yeah. earlier in my career being told that, you know, when you're reading a book, kids don't have to sit still. Like they'll, they'll be moving mm -hmm. a bit. And I had these twins who um, had a lot of like uh, sensory needs. And I remember reading a book and they were literally, um, they didn't have glasses on, but um, the, the <laughs> brother was using his sister's face as his fidget, basically. <laughs> just like... <laughs> you know, like squeezing her face and, you know, like just, and she's just kind of sitting there and I'm, and in my head, all I could think of was I'm going to ignore that because no one else is bothered. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to keep reading, but I know those two just, they won't get this information. That's, you know, I'll just have to be okay with that. They'll have to make it up later. Well, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever I was thinking at the time, but I remember like three weeks later, something came up. And so it was a book about um, Martin Luther King. And somebody said something about Birmingham. There's a parent who had grown up in Birmingham. And the kid who's um, mm -hmm. had been, you know, rubbing his sister's face, like turns out, oh, like Martin Luther King. <laughs> now I know I only read that book once because I soon realized, oh, that was written for first grade, not for... <laughs> um, Preschoolers. Notice how I didn't say anything about that earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very exactly. demure, very mindful. Right. Well, and I was, yeah. <laughs> but then I was like, I had never read that book again. And yet he remembered a detail. And he was the one that I assumed yeah. wasn't paying attention. Right. And I think that was the first aha moment for me of like, oh. So, it, you know, first, all I was doing was, you know, doing the one step. But I wasn't appreciating the learning. And now, you know, when that's happening, I'm like, I'm just going to assume the kids are getting what they need out of something. Mm -hmm. And if they were sitting crisscross applesauce, the same thing would happen. They may or may not like, right. There's like you said, the difference between teaching and learning too often, like canned curriculum or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, letter of the week, all of that's based on the idea of like, Oh, if you teach it now you're done check. Mm -hmm. And if you're actually concerned about what kids are learning, it's like, when do you see them apply the thing they learned? And if it's something they can't apply, it means you're probably not being developmentally informed, right? Mm -hmm. You're not doing what they need developmentally because they don't have a way of applying it. Yeah. And if they did, they would apply it. And that's what you actually should worry about or be concerned with. And you know, it's a separate thing to talk about whether we need to assess that or just. And I, would add, and I would add, Mike, that uh, <clears throat> it may be physically they, they, they show it rather than verbally. So yes, you you have to be attuned to that. That's your word, right? Attuned. Yeah, he invented it's not that. my word, but it, yeah, he I invented uh, it. It is my drinking game. Yes, <laughs> we we've gone this far without using attunement, you know, into the episode. It's pretty. It wow. might be a record for us. The other piece that's in that Rafi statement, though, like you know, we're talking we're talking about what sort of frustrates teachers, you know, to yeah. get their lessons across and this kind of thing. But like, if I just took a second to look at it again and it's talking about nurturing them to flourish. And I also think that it, built into the word nurture is the the body and the physical mm -hmm. connection. And I think the other thing that happens in our field is, you know, we're, we're stuck with, a, if we if we want to be professionals and we want to call ourselves teachers and we're teaching babies because we want to have a professional title, mm -hmm. um, which I understand I'm not, I'm not denigrating professionalizing the field, but then the only sort of model we have is what we think of as like an elementary school, middle school, high school teacher. 
and you don't like pick up and cuddle your middle school kid. I mean, maybe they'd do better if you did, but you right. don't. Can't, can't, I don't know. <laughs> you know and so there. I think like to put the nurturing, the other thing I think is really important about that quote that you chose is to remind ourselves yeah. that, that, that what's unique about childhood is you need to be nurtured and cared for. You're still at a stage of development where someone right. has to care for you and right. not assume that you know how to do everything in the world and that you're ready to do it all for yourself and you know because the other thing that we talk about a lot is like helping and teaching independence and you know walking mm -hmm. these lines and like they're just little people they right. didn't know like and it's okay and right. and we're here for them you know so i think that nurturing part um is another thread that comes up in our conversations a bit um as well or like oh you gotta also learn how to use the bathroom in the middle of all this <laughs> you know or like like and and we're just like annoyed it's like yeah no, you don't even know what a cup is. Like we're just figuring some of these things out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that nurturing piece is another thing I'd like just want to draw back out from that quote because I think that's really important when we're thinking about especially early childhood. And sometimes yeah. we want to say that's not our job. Right. So, sometimes. Yeah. Oh, I, I, oh, oh go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I'm glad you brought it back to that because um, I was sort of falling into the trap that bothers me when other people fall into it and focusing on but well, how so do we simple. get them to teach? How do we teach them? So coming back to that last part of the quote, I think is really, um, it uh, happens to all of us because yeah. again, that's how we get seen as respectable yeah. professional. Like it's just, I mean, it's just yeah. there. It's, and it's a know. lens that we know everyone else is looking through too. And so it's not a bad lens. It's just yeah. one of them. Yeah. Right. Go and on. I want to talk about, so, and I think you're right, Joey, that as kids get older, some of the care is, is done. Some of it they can do on their own. Some of it is something that's done at other times. They can delay a certain need longer. But at the same time, there's often needs that just get ignored or are considered, oh, that's now a special ed worry, mm -hmm. not ours. Because there's this fifth grader that I um, ha have known, but you know, got in touch with the family yesterday, and they were talking about that the child um, so has some diagnoses and some things that aren't diagnosed yet, but was failing in school, could not, didn't want to be there, hated it, wasn't learning anything. And now they're doing this like homeschooling where they're part of a co-op. So they do part of what they do is they go to a farm and then they do like some, like the lessons, whatever the fifth grade, you know, requirement, education requirements are, but they're like taking care of animals and they go to this like thing on the computer for a little while and they go, and it's, um, the child, they're doing it amazing, right? They're like, they love school. They can't wait to get, they gave a cow a mani-pedi um, <laughs> recently, you know, just the, all this stuff, but they're also learning more. And it's like, that was a child that needed a little more care than is typical. And what happens, I think, later in life is the same thing about standards. If the child doesn't meet a standard, typical way of care, the school has no, all they can do is put them in a special ed room and let that, per, or get a para to take mm -hmm. care of those needs. And it's not the teacher's responsibility. And what I love about the, how this child is doing it, it's like, no, it is, it's all the same thing. Like, and it, I think that's always true to a certain degree is that care um, is so much a part of what we do. The nurturance, um, Last year, uh, Carol Garbode and Murray came to town and, and Lisa Murphy, and it was just funny. We were all talking about how we all have a different lens, but actually it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like that care includes allowing for the squishing someone on a mat or fighting a ball with <laughs> others, but it also means diapering or, you know, learning to use the toilet or, or how to use a cup. Like mm -hmm. all of those things are part of that, you know, and then play fits in too because it's again the same thing of what is what are the child's needs how do they meet them how do we help them meet them so i'm i'm reading the book the role of the pedagogista in the reggio emilia um and uh, i've only got the few pages in and uh, one of the things they talk about are the ethic of care mm -hmm. and they're saying that you need to place care at the center of our work and that's, I think that's what you've been talking mm -hmm. about. And I was trying to think, what does that mean? What does that actually mean? And one of the examples I thought about was, uh, you know, if you're diapering a child, you can just do it mechanically, or it can be something that uh, it, it, it's something we do and we 
create a relationship, a reciprocal <clears throat> relationship. And, and, and that's, that's kind of getting at care rather than just the mechanical mm -hmm. thing of changing diapers. I'm not quite, I'm, I haven't, can't figure out, uh, 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 an example in preschool yet, but I'll think about it. <laughs> well, when I, um, so, so Carol wrote her book two or three years ago now and blew my mind. And then Stacey Benj wrote a book last year about literacy with a whole bunch of stuff about movement that blew my mind. So, um, I, I've just, this has been, and I'm trying to write a book and trying to make sure I'm being very, um, intentional about including movement and stuff, but to bring the ethic of care into the conversation about movement, I thought, what if it's just caring why they're moving? What if it's not like a physical act of care that we're doing, like changing the diaper? Although, Tom, I could talk about that forever, too. That shift that I had when I started moving from mechanical to, to more intentional. But what if it's just these kids keep moving and I care why they keep moving. So I'm going to be curious about it. And I'm going to have mm -hmm. that pause, if nothing else, to wonder why this is happening and if this isn't a good time for it to happen, when else do they get that chance for it to happen? And maybe they can't wait for our 20 minute slot on the playground for this to happen. That's, yeah. I think one of the hard things is also balancing, <clears throat> you know, the dreams, the, the hopes of what ideal early childhood care, early childhood education looks like with the reality of like, yeah, but you've got it's you and 10 kids and you do only have that 20 minute window because yeah. there's six other groups coming to the, yeah. to use this space. Um, and like Tom, you're, you're um, kind of quote from the, the Reggio book where the ethics of care reminded me of a, um, an example that Chris, um, Tony Christie um, from New Zealand, she and her husband, Robin created the child space Um child space space uh, out in, in New Zealand, but they, I remember attending one of their discussions and it was, you know, for that infant classroom, if you have just scheduled diaper change, it's nine o'clock and then mm -hmm. it's 11 o'clock and whether they're soiled or not, you just got to get it done because it's got to get done. Well, even that removes the the kind of that membership from the community you're just going to be yeah. a part of this thing we're not going to honor where you're really at so mm -hmm. what they talked about was it's a machine then it's not a community exactly yeah. so now it's not whether you need this or not it's that i need to do this because i've got to get to the next thing mm -hmm. and then even that subtlety that messaging that comes from your needs really aren't important and when you're an infant they're they're simply inherent they're reflexive they're means to get the care that you need they're reflexive that's the word i was looking mm -hmm. for i need to have this like response but you don't seem to care like you're just mm -hmm. going to do it when you can get to it and so that's where like i think we've jumped a little bit but it's hard to kind of also only take the it'd be great if we all had this uh you know several different teachers to be able to, to, to tend to each child, every, even early child or even like elementary classroom had multiple teachers and the reality there isn't. So I think at least I'll speak from my own perspective, like our conversations, I think are, I see them as those opportunities for how do you, the teacher who are in this tough situation, mm -hmm. how can you still step back and really honor the children that you have versus no, they've got to come with me because we got to get to this next thing. And if we don't get to this next thing, then we're going to miss out. Or if I don't get this evaluation or this checklist or get you to pass these things, well, then it reflects on me that I'm not teaching or that you're not learning. I am teaching, but you're not learning. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, it's and, if you only measure the teaching, that reminds well, me. Well, then you're just performing because without learning, there is no teaching. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, then yeah. It's, it's the system then. It's yeah. not, it's, I mean, there's something wrong with the system because then it's not, then you're not putting uh, care at the center of your practice. Yeah. I'd like to to introduce you to a bit, little band that kind of shares that we're, you could rage against the machine. <laughs> and uh, it turns out they've got some messages about kind of breaking yeah. the system. Yeah, they're an up and coming yeah. group coming out of. Uh, I, think I think they're the really going to get there. Yeah. yeah. They've got some strong, uh, some, uh, some ideas that could uh, really shake things up. And young children just love to dance to it. <laughs> we we do play, we do yeah, play. Yeah, that is true. Ways, I do uh, like to dance to it. 
Um, I, I want to just say quickly, though, Ross, when you're talking, it reminded me of taking my mom to the airport. And she's older now and doesn't understand this, like, ticket on your phone, you know, and <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. neither do things. I. And she, you know, went to the help desk. And it was one of those ones where I went with her, but was I'm not going to be going on the flight with her. So I need her to just... Get and, the gate pass, my friend. Get the gate pass. Go on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, but the, the person at the counter, it was taking longer than the person before. Yep. Right? And it was just that thing of, like, but it... Luckily, we had, a, like, someone who's good at this, right? They didn't just, sorry, I got to get to the next customer. There's mm -hmm. a line here. You go figure it out. It was, what do you need? And finally, he's, why don't we call a uh, wheelchair over? And that person will take you everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now that's, you know, I, all my siblings, I tell them, oh, if mom's coming to town, just do the wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> she did like walking that far actually is hard for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's not just that it's all of the cognitive things that are like, you know, wait, which ID do you need? What, you know, mm -hmm. so, but, it, but, you know, but it was that a thing of that person, if they treat it as a checklist, here's the thing I have to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what we often do with, it can do with diaper mm -hmm. changes or things like that, rather than what do you need? Okay, let's figure out how I can meet your needs. Mm -hmm. And I, you poop a lot, we're going to check your diaper more often. <laughs> or well, I know, I, when you change, you get into that cycle. Keep trying to be changed at the same time. Gonna, yeah, you're not getting in. I'm going to get <laughs> in. I'm going to get in. I'm standing now. So I like, <laughs> I'm going but off. I, but I think you, you were I, all the, I wanted to make sure you could get all those points because I think it's, it's a great illustration of how to individualize for the person in the moment, mm -hmm. which that the attendant could have been like, Hey, next in line, next time. But I think what we also try to do with, with, um, these classroom uh, examples and discussions is that it's not just that person. Now it's everybody else who's in line, who isn't blowing their stack because you're mm -hmm. like, Hey, uh, this is taking too long. I need my things. Oh, you're a part of a community. Mm -hmm. You've got different needs than I do. We're all in this together. So I, I am just going to be able to, now I can look at my phone a little bit longer and just wait for my turn rather than getting so mm -hmm. cranky and, and recognizing that this person is inconveniencing me yeah. versus, oh, look at them. They need a little extra help and look at the people giving them the attention they need. So again, I feel like those discussions that we have at group time are to help to go back to use Gus, we can help Gus, but then all the rest of the classmates recognize that Gus needs something different than I do. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And well, it doesn't put me and that out. might be the it most actually, important thing to learn. Yes. It makes it it makes us really care for one another. Cause if the if the if it, let's say it's a one to ten and Gus is over there and the teacher's having to help somebody with a bloody nose or they're sad because they um they really miss their grown-up at drop-off hey i know gus likes trucks gus you want to play trucks mm -hmm. and whatever that but again it's that that community of caring for one another and really recognizing that we're all in this together versus yeah. it's me and i'm on my track and i need to get what i need because i need to get to the next thing yeah well and people ask because that was a like a clinical preschool for speech language pathologist studiers mm -hmm. and so the grad students who were in there you know they would say things like well why did you let Gus do it and no one else got to do it and my answer was no one else was showing me they needed to do it right if they right. needed it they you were attuned him. yeah <laughs> um but they were rolling on their bellies and sitting by their friends and it wasn't like everybody was crisscross applesauce eyes on me but Gus got to go do his yeah. thing well, you didn't like, say gus today's your turn to walk around yeah exactly, like you just, right? like because then you're managing Sorry, you walked yesterday whose picture the sign up schedule of like who gets yeah. to walk around today and now yeah. you've just created more work for yourself yeah. versus like oh you guys can kind of figure out what you yeah. what you need without me managing it to like yeah. a precise yeah level so let, let, let me kind of uh, tweak or uh, change the conversation just a little bit Oh, trouble, Tommy. perhaps? Tommy uh, trouble? Well, Tommy I trouble. Bring, I want to bring the children into it and how they're able to help help with care how of each you. other. It's not always just the teacher who's yes. who's doing everything. It's <clears throat> and then what happens, and one of the jobs of the teacher then is to recognize what's happening when the children are caring for each other because then you are building the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a little different because we've talked mostly about the teacher. Yeah. 
I right. think we we need to bring the children back into this. Well, and to, to I mean to take it possibly too too far, or but like this makes me think of I'm going intrigued. to Mike's airport example, oh. which trust me, I've been there. Um, and like so, if somebody else on the line, like in the perfect world, we do a great job at preschool. We teach kids that they can also help take care of each other. And it's not always someone else's job, right? You're not just waiting passively for problems to get solved so you get your help. <laughs> well, somebody could have said, "Hey." I'm also going to gate 13. Follow me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, that can happen too. That like, obviously if something business with the airport, air, airline, you've got to do your airline business with the airline people, but like for the ticket, but like that, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. take your example time. It's like, well, then everybody can start to see themselves as they can also be helpful yeah. and they can also be effective. And we all know if you teach them, teach something really early, like, no, you can't do that. That's going to get extinguished. So, I mean, right to take it possibly too seriously like this is super important if we're not doing this when the kids are young you know these 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 instincts could just actually kind of be faded out because yeah. they're like eh, never mind someone else's job to do that i just sit and wait yeah i think that's part of i think it was louise derman sparks who wrote about it being the this, the work being deeply hopeful like there's a deep hope in early childhood work that we can impact future communities in this way by the way we live in community or don't live in community with them that now. sounds like louise for sure <laughs> <laughs> i was like was it margie carter or carter or louise i think it's probably louise so I, I let me just emphasize one more time about if it's happening in the classroom one of the jobs of the teacher is to recognize it mm -hmm. and then that then it'll it then you'll see some contagion where kids are are helping each other and with without even asking it's like it kind of kind of like magic right so yeah the more you try to institute that like i'm going to make sure you're all sitting crisscross applesauce i'm going to make sure this and you will get the kids who are like you know tom's not sitting crisscross yes. applesauce you know like you'll get that input but you won't get the like oh he's having trouble i you know Mm -hmm. I suggested, you know, he, you know, find something that's more comfortable. Maybe pacing will help him or whatever. Like the way we're talking is you will instill that in all the kids and create that. And if you don't, you're just creating, you know, you're, you're going to get an ulcer, right? You're just like, you are controlling everything. And then they're kids. So you never will. You're herding cats. And, you know, the way to herd cats is to not herd cats. Yeah. <laughs> right. And yes. You know, and you will feel better. You will like, let me sit back and right? enjoy the cats and yeah. make little videos to, you know, post <laughs> instead. Um, and don't post videos of the kids without permission. It's right. Uh, yes. But that idea of the more you try to control, the more you realize you're out of control. Right. And then you can either spiral down trying harder or, oh, oh, if I raise my voice, that might work. Or if I do this, or if I refer them to special needs, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm, Obviously not saying that there aren't kids who need extra support, right? but you can actually find which kids need extra support and which kids just needed, like Gus needed your classroom um, instead of the ones that he was kicked out of because they Gus weren't trying to figure out what other. Gus needed. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but it's almost like it, it actually is a way to, by creating a community where everyone is caring for each other, you have less to try to stress about, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a risk if we aren't thinking in that way of sending a real message that community matters, but only the community that looks and acts like me. You step outside of that and there's something other about you, um, which is like the anti-hopefulness <laughs> of the work. Well, and it's, and we do it in those ways, like I'm, thinking i'm just looking at our, our zoom screen here that you know if that child needs glasses in the classroom yeah we're not going to make everybody have not everybody has to then wear glasses in in the classroom so yeah there's some ways where like it makes sense and i was like can we just take examples like that and pull it back and be like well you know and maybe that's more for the adults or like the other educators like well i'm gonna have to do it for everybody like well no you don't mm -hmm. it's it can be pretty simple and that, you know, who's going to catch on to that really quick? The other kids. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Oh, but then why do they get to have a fidget? Well, here, I have a basket. If you want one, take one. Yeah. And I had it 
you know, I, I'm thinking to my group last year, we brought it out and guess what? The first day we brought out the fidget basket, everybody grabbed one and group didn't go for very long because <laughs> it was all about the fidgets. That's okay. That but was the got, time. Yeah. yeah that yeah, yeah, it was the learning happening. Exactly. And it was, if I'm going to hold to my script or my, like, this is my, but my lesson plan says I have to do this. Well, then I'm not teaching to them. I'm only I'm only doing what I think they need versus what they're showing me they mm -hmm. need. Mm -hmm. But then as we kind of got into it, some kids, what started to happen was great. Is everybody would still go to the basket and then every like half the group would just put it back down <laughs> in the basket. And they're like, okay. And then we, then we would continue on. Mm -hmm. And it looks, turns out that then people were getting what they needed. Everybody can have access to it if you want it. Cause maybe you're, maybe you do need this too. And I don't even know it. Or maybe your need is not that you need to actually fidget, but fidget, but you want to hold on to this thing because the person you're trying to be friends with is holding on to this mm -hmm. thing. And this might be that this this connection point. So again, there's so many facets to this, you know. <laughs> this is, I don't know, my brain. It's awesome blossom, you know, of <laughs> you know, education is all of these layers. You're just trying peels. to find your trademark. <laughs> I, I can can we I want a sponsorship from you know Applebee's to have the awesome Are blossom. Are they still somehow. in business? I, they if still they, exist. They if, sure are. If only, yep. if okay. only for that product, I hope it's still there. But anyways, <laughs> I think the Awesome Blossom is Outback Steakhouse. Ah, uh, see, that's why I can't get the sponsorship. I You're, blew it. Uh, yep, you'll never get them now. No, <laughs> I think oh, I said well. you. I think I. I think I'm the one who said Applebee's. I'm sorry, it was my fault. <laughs> no, I think I think uh, I'm gonna run bye, back to my bye, own like bye. mental like. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I had one at Applebee's, but maybe anyway, it doesn't they matter. They call it something different there. Yes, they do. A blooming onion. There it is. Mm, That's what it like was. That? Yep. Yes. So see, this is where now welcome to my brain, everybody. This is how uh, <laughs> sounds a lot like the, Mike's brain. <laughs> the things that make sense uh in my mind that are great analogies and metaphors, then Sorry, derail go with me the onion. Into What's gonna about happen with your onion metaphor? Go back. But it's it's exactly that where you might not even realize that there's this other layer of learning or kind of and in this case like relationship building establishing community that's going on oh but i i've created the opportunity where now i can find another way that these children connect and as as they'll bring i as the children bring ideas to answer questions or to kind of like hey, what if we did this i didn't even think about that but i guess we could if i'm creating those opportunities to really have this be a community they'll show me new ways mm -hmm. that they're connecting and if i can recognize that that's where we need to go rather than, yeah, that's great, but let's go back to, you know, counting to 10 because that's what I got to tell you about today. So Ross is our job to deep fry the onion so that we can all see the beauty. It's, you know, I think we got to look at it like the children. It's just, we a gotta, it's just a metaphor. Okay. The sous, who's the sous chef to like prep the onion? Who's battering? Who gets to be the fryer? Who's expoing it to the, to sure. the people who are eating it. I mean, to use the it's metaphor. It's a whole new episode. You know, that the sense that I think it oddly enough, again, in my mind, to see the connection of like, it's more than one person, right? Like there's, and this is where our group is the, we're the chefs of the blooming onion because we talk to one another about what's the best way to prepare this. I don't know. I feel stuck. I can never get the batter to stick. Well, Hey, mm -hmm. have you tried this? Right. And, and it I'm also shows, a, have you right, tried like letting the, the oven, onion is, move more? How do you need to <laughs> organize the room, the environment? How do you and your right. co-teachers need to have an understanding. How does your administrator need to help? You know what I mean? Like it, like if yeah. you have these 20 minute outdoor times, would it actually be better to have um, 40 minutes every other day and 40 minutes of doing more physical things in your room or whatever the thing, right. like you might have to actually change things in other places. Um, and you can decide how far to go, right? So some people will actually go to, um, well, I, I think we need to change higher ed, or I think we need to change, you know, how teachers get paid. And they'll go into those areas, mm -hmm. which is great mm -hmm. um, for, I think, us, um, well, at least the four of us, I guess you are a bit more on the higher ed side of things. I know. So you do some of that. I used um, to but be. for us, it's like <laughs> the centers we've worked at, part of it is, change. like, how is the whole center working? Right is a big part of what we do because just doing it in a classroom there's limits that don't need to be there yeah sometimes it's out of your control and you have to figure out what to do with it but knowing what layers of the onion you can but you can at least peel back to know oh that's actually the stumbling block <laughs> 
you know, and then you, you can address it or you can't. Either it's yeah. already deep fried and you can't change it or. I mean, is it even to recognize that it's an onion in its own, that you can actually open this thing up and there are more layers versus here's the whole thing. Eat it like an apple. And you're like, oh, my God, this is. Yeah. It's a lot. Ooh, there's, there's the metaphor. There it is. Because then it's like, I can't change <laughs> anything. It's like, no, there's lots of layers you might change. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, we, it, I don't know. We've been going a while. I think maybe I don't know how it long. might be time to wrap up. I will just clarify the awesome blossom is Chili's restaurant. <gasps> there it is. I knew there was one. Never saw the onion going up. is the Outback Steakhouse. I had my So Applebee's has no onion that. product? Well, no, it, it did was not Chili's. come up in the Google search. <laughs> and now that you said that, it's like, I know I can see the restaurant. It was, yeah. this is the location in my mental map from childhood. It was <laughs> Chili's. That makes more sense. Yeah. I don't know if they're still around. Okay. Anyway, Mike, we didn't Fonsoros. talk about how we're wrapping it up. With this, oh, this yeah. Fancy crossover episode. I feel like um, I feel like we followed your format. So, <laughs> I mean, usually all we do is thank. Actually, we do the same thing. We just said, "Well, thank you for the conversation." Blah blah yeah, blah blah. Wrapping it up is my. But who does it? Strength. Well, I'm going to say, "Well, thanks, Heather, for yes. joining us." Yeah, thank you all for being okay. um, being on the Nerd Show. It was really great. I could have kept going but i think i think maybe we're more than an hour but i could have kept going for a lot longer yeah and i've got to get to chili we like now. to leave them yeah. wanting more <laughs> yes exactly yeah. we've all got to go get those appetizers now chili's <laughs> does open at 11 so we can go there and get to it but maybe dare we say maybe we do this again sometime that would be great yeah. i'd love it yeah yeah, yeah for sure fun. yeah and thanks to everybody Thank who's listening yeah, yeah thanks, everybody. Thank you. Right.